the person that is here today, Manjit Dasani, um, is the expert at CERN. She's the, the consultant of medical applications at CERN. Um, she studied uh, at MIT in, in Berkeley, then came to CERN, and is now running medical applications <coughs> at, at CERN. She's head of the, a big European project it's called Endite, which is about uh, cancer treatments based on you will tell us all about it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marcel. Thank you also to Pepe Benve for introducing and for inviting me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. By the way, I was just saying that it was almost 10 years ago when I was in this very room when um, Marcel just alluded to the Enlight network that I coordinate. Can, what, do I have to be somewhere here? No, up there. Up there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't like being so far away from <laughs> Is that okay? Okay, so, um, and this is mine? Yeah, okay. So, as I said, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I don't know about being an expert, but I'll try to tell you a little bit about uh, what, where we can go from particle physics to medical applications. And when I was appointed in 2000 at, 2000 at CERN, I was made, I was asked to make the bridge from how do you go from a 27 kilometer LHC to something that fits in a single room which could be actually practical and useful in real time, not 20 or 30 <coughs> years as the particle physicists are able to wait, but within a two or three years time frame. And that's asking for a lot, I have to say, okay? So we'll see. So I want to tell you a little bit about CERN for some of you who don't know. And, and actually, there is, there's two reasons I want to tell you something about CERN. One is CERN was founded in September 1954 as a place, science for peace after the Second World War to try to bring people together, as have a center of excellence, open collaboration, <coughs> no weapons research. I mean, that's part of our mandate coming from UNESCO, because the reason I say this is when I first came to Geneva, lots of people thought that the word nuclear meant that we do nuclear weapons research. On the contrary, it's really an open access laboratory where we publish everything and we collaborate. And, and the other thing that I want to tell you about this, founded in September 1954, and we're going to come to that right at the end as well, I came from Berkeley to CERN, and the very first patient was treated in, with hadrons, the same hadrons that go around in our large hadron collider, same month and same year. So the question I will pose now and then later on, how come CERN is now the, the leading laboratory, everybody's heard of CERN, what happened to particle therapy, hadron therapy, because I know you don't have one yet in Spain. Lots of places don't have one. You'd think that logically, since it's to do with treating patients and its health, that actually might be faster in progress than looking for the Higgs or black matter or whatever. So what, what's, where's the challenge? Okay. And the other thing to say is that now, CERN uh, E was for Europe, a year and a half ago, we you see that Israel has become a member. And the previous DG, Rolf Hoyer, said, so the E in CERN is for everywhere, no longer Europe. Okay, so we are really a global laboratory, and associate member states, new membership, and lots of people looking to be part of this big family, which is very interesting and very nice. And actually, yesterday, I just came from Latvia, where Latvia is looking to be part of CERN as well, because some of the smaller countries who are now looking to see how they can be part of a global collaboration where they can share ideas, work together, and move the field forward. So the idea of working together is part of the, shall we say, the uh, DNA of CERN, if you like. Okay? Being a biologist, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, where should I? So, so the mission of CERN, of course, we are pushing the frontiers of knowledge. I mean, that's, we are supposed to do science, we do research, we do physics, and the secrets of the Big Bang. But in order to be able 
to push back the frontiers of knowledge, you need technologies to make that happen. Particularly if you're doing cutting edge technologies which you can't go and buy from a company from the shelf, so you have to develop them, okay? The accelerators and detectors and so on. And, and this, this, some of those technologies then are used in other, other fields. And I will tell you a little bit about the medical field. And actually, if you want to develop technologies, you also need the people to develop them. So where do you get those from? Because they don't exist either. Because if you're really cutting the frontiers of science, you're wanting the best young people to be doing science. I mean, of course, at CERN we would like them to do physics, but as a scientist, I think all sciences, it doesn't matter which. And so how do we inspire the future young people and train them to do the science of tomorrow, okay? And then, and of course, that is part of the thing, is uniting people from different countries and different cultures to work together. Which, by the way, coming from the medical field, that was the thing that fascinated me. How do you do that? We, we, are, not, we are not able to do that very well in the medical field, I can tell you that. And so, I'm not going to say too much about CERN, but just to say, so the mission of CERN is to push the frontiers of knowledge. And, and 2010 was a new era in fundamental science when the Large Hadron Collider started. And not, not long afterwards, actually, in 2012, was the discovery of the Higgs and then the Nobel Prize in 2013. So, um, but there are plenty of physicists in the audience, so I'm sure that if you want to know more about physics, you should ask them, because I'm not a physicist. But just to say that this idea that 50 years later, when the Higgs was predicted, was that confirmed through the collaboration. That's a long time. And I was thinking, is there something parallel that happens in the medical field? Now, just to say that the Nobel Prize for the MRI discovery from the physics, chemistry point of view, was 50 years earlier before we won the prize in the medicine and physiology. So it can take a long time for basic technology ideas to be discovered before it becomes an application. So, but you know, it does. It, we in the medical field don't wait, can't afford to wait that long because our patients need technologies now and not in 50 years. Okay? So, okay, so, so certain technologies, we accelerate particles, we detect particles, and then we do lots of analysis and try to find out what's going on. Okay? So how how can we use these basic technologies to meet the challenges of medical application? So when I came to CERN in 2000, my job was, as I said, was to really to see how those technologies can be used in the field and how to make those bridges. And when I came, the thing I know most is about cancer biology, so of course that's where I started. Uh, but when you think about so accelerating particles for particle therapy, but it can also be for x-rays, but that was already done by the time I came to CERN in 2000, so I didn't need to work on that. Um, for imaging, and for medical data management analysis, referring patients, medicine is coming more and more specialized, so you really do need to be able to work together and imaging so you can have clinical data from one place, you can have an X-ray image from another one, an MRI from somewhere else. How do you try to manage all of those together for the benefit of the patient? The patient shouldn't have to move unless he or she has to. So let's try to use some of the tools. But for me, the most important pillar, which at CERN is just taken for granted, is really catalyzing and facilitating collaborations. How can you try to put all those together for the benefit of the patient. And as I said, I came from the field of cancer biology, so I decided I will start with something I'm comfortable with. And so I will put cancer in the middle of these three technologies and see what I can do that's being done already in order to try to help to catalyze this process. And by the way, and of course, if I was a young person trying to do one of these nice games that we have to target the cancer and avoid the healthy tissue and really do that, that would be easy. But how to do that in reality with a patient is, is an interesting challenge, okay? And, and why, so not only is it that I put cancer in the middle because I know quite a bit about it because that's my background, but also cancer is an important challenge 
is increasing huge global mortality is, has an astronomical cost actually. 25 new million cases by 2030 every year. And the global cost, that's the last one I could find was 2009, 286 billion for cost of cancer. <coughs> And you know, and the cure rates achieved with about 45 to 50 percent, depending on the country, where you are, how early the diagnosis is, and radiation therapy plays quite a key role in this. And at the moment, around eight million people die as a result of cancer. So it's a big challenge. So one could also think, not only from the patient's point of view, that they should live longer have a better prognosis and better treatment. And also just from the health system point of view, politically as well, it's a huge cost. So what can we do in trying to somehow counteract that? And so being a biologist, and I, I, I know that there are some physicists, particularly young people, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about biology because our, our, our bodies are really fine-tuned machines. They are really wonderful how we do everything as it's supposed to be. So what happens when you get cancer? What is it? And, and one of the interesting things was that when I was, I was at MIT actually when this discovery happened is that normally our cells, when they're growing, when they touch each other, they stop growing. This is called something called contact inhibition. So as soon as they sense the other cell, they don't grow anymore. It's an amazing thing when you think about it. So you don't invade somebody else's space. And you can relate that to anything globally, not just for the cells, okay? And, and one, of, one of the things that happens in cancer cells is this, this contact inhibition is lost. So the cells are no longer inhibited by touching something else. And the second thing that happens in cancer cells, and the reason I want to tell you that is because some of the properties which make cells cancer cells are also the properties we have to deal with if you want to try to detect and treat. And the second thing that happens with our cells is our cells normally divide so many times and then they senesce. They no longer divide. Cancer cells lose this particular control and they can divide forever. So they become immortal. Immortality comes at a price. Okay, and this is and one of the reasons, of course, so when the cells can divide forever and ever, is this is why you get this mass of cells. And eventually, if some of those cells break away and go somewhere else, that's metastasis. Okay? So if you're talking about challenging and trying to have a better outcome, you need to be able to detect the cancer as early as possible. Okay? And preferably before it metastasizes, because if once metastasis has happened, it's very difficult really to fight this battle, okay? So, now, I'm talking about physics, so of course there are lots of molecular biological techniques also to see when some of those changes are happening, um, but from a physics point of view, how can we use some of the detector technologies to detect the tumor as early as possible? Okay, that's the challenge. And, well, how is an interesting word, right? And um, lots has happened even since I came to CERN in 2000 as how to detect this. And, and you know, our cells are very well defending themselves. And there is a gene and sorry, you're going to learn a little bit of biology, a little bit of chemistry, and a little bit of physics, because it's really a multidisciplinary challenge in a multidisciplinary field. There is a gene called P53. For those of you who are physicists, don't, don't care. P for protein, 53 is the size. Okay? And it was in the Nature paper, the guardian of the human genome. This, this gene is supposed to protect our cells, to make sure they stay as they are. That's why it's called the guardian of the human genome. Okay? And as soon as the DNA is damaged, this gene is expressed and it doesn't let the cell DNA replicate and divide <coughs> until the DNA has been completely repaired. Nice, no? However, if the 
cell is not capable of repairing the DNA, and the P53 is still so there, the cell commits suicide called apoptosis. So it would rather remove itself from the system than to perpetuate and carry on. Very interesting fine-tuned mechanisms. And, and cancer is a multi-step process where so a number of things happen and the cell keeps changing. And that's why it also is a big challenge as to how to detect it, how to treat it, because it's not, it's not a single disease, if you like. It's a multi-step process. Okay? And the second thing is, we are growing, uh, well, we're living longer, which is very nice. However, the chances of us getting cancer also increases, because the longer you live, the more mutations can happen before cancer will evolve. Okay? So there are a number of things that are going on. Okay, so, and then the detection part. So now I've told you some of those things. Some of those detection and treatment are dealing with this idea of the cell is not inhibited, it carries on growing, and often there are changes in these tumors, um, genes. By the way, so as I said, P53, as I said, guardian of the human genome, is called a tumor suppressor gene because it suppresses tumors. Okay. Interestingly, when you get mutations in this gene, it becomes almost like an oncogene so that it increases tumors. It looks like it's no longer a tumor specific gene. Just to say, so it's always an interesting challenge when you're looking at all of this. Okay, so tumor, normal growth, malignant and controlled spread. So how do you treat it? There are three methods, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Okay? And the Irrespective of what it is that is used for treating, I mean, the aim is survival, but also the quality of life. So it's not enough for the patient to survive, but also what the quality of life is very, very important as well. Okay? Now, if we're going to talk about physics, let me say that we don't, we don't know much about surgery or chemotherapy. Physics can't handle that. We don't, you know, we don't have the... But, but what physics can help is with the radiotherapy. Okay? Now, I say that we can't do anything with surgery. However, if surgery is cutting out the tumor, you need to know exactly where the tumor is and very precisely, conformally. And it's one of the methods which is most widely used and nobody's asking for clinical trials. It's considered normal to be able to do that because, and often that's the first bit, and then you're followed by chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and so on. I mean, the doctors have never asked for trials for surgery. And yet, when you think about it, it's the most violent to the body. Okay? So, therefore, even though we in physics can't help any with surgery, but the tools of defining the edges and the size and as small as possible are coming from the physics developments and also some of the microsurgery and some of the imaging techniques of how this is happening also are coming from there. Chemotherapy, we'll, we'll leave that for the moment, okay? So what, what are accelerators and radiation therapy doing for cancer? If you think about it, this is basically a crude very early method after soon after x-rays were discovered in 1895. By the way, when x-rays were discovered, this was the fastest technology transfer ever. You've seen the hand of Rontigan's wife within a few weeks of when he discovered x-rays, and he won the very first Nobel Prize. And but I also told you MRI took 50 years, you know, so somewhere in between there are challenges. And for hadron therapy, when the first patient was treated at the same time CERN was founded, and we are still looking to see how we can have those machines. So there are many things in between. But basically, you have the X-ray source, you have a detector, you have the object, and you have the pattern recognition. And until, you know, over the last 30 years, it was the doctor who was a pattern recognition, because he, we relied on his or her knowledge, experience, expertise as to do how to do all of that. Now, over the last number of years, there are many tools in order to help our wonderful physicians. Okay? Um, sometimes they're not even aware the tools exist, but so it's really important that we actually work together to see what the tools are to help them to be able to help not the object, but the patient. Okay? 
Okay? So, so the challenge of the treatment, of course, is the holy grail. Treat the tumor, the whole tumor, and nothing but the tumor. That's, that's what we're looking for. We're not there yet. I don't know when we will be there. Magic bullets are being looked for, but I don't know. It may not be radiation therapy in the end. It may be a particular gene-targeted therapy. It could be a theranostic drug. It could be a molecular drug. Who knows? Okay? But we do know that radiotherapy, when it's delivered, has two equally important goals. One is to destroy the tumor, but equally important is to prep protect the surrounding normal health tissue. That is really, you know, you have to deal with both of those at the same time. And, and radiation therapy is used either alone or together with surgery or chemotherapy, but the, the thing is always the same. Get rid of the tumor and protect the healthy tissues. Which is fine, but you know, we can't change physics. And, and the conventional treatment of photons or x-rays is that they deposit their energy like this and then <coughs> goes down exponentially. So if your tumor doesn't happen to be near the surface, you have a bit of a challenge. How do you try to destroy the tumor with 100% of the energy and yet protect all the tissue that is crossing before it gets there? But medical physicists and physicists that are interesting with working on technologies. So, okay, so let's try to use the best we can with the tools we have. So, now if you do two fields, you can get 100%, and it's no longer 160, 170, it's 110. Better, but still not enough, because certainly all the cells that were transversed are dead, because it's more than 100% of the energy. But, nevertheless, Many techniques are being used using a number of fields, number of ways of trying to get around it. And basically, <coughs> conventional radiation therapy now is the least expensive cancer treatment method. And most of the so-called Western European country in the US, the cost of radiation therapy is somewhere around 10%. That's just the radiation. We're not talking about imaging, we're not talking about detection or the other tools of the treatment. It's one of the most effective, so either alone or in combination, you can get from 45 to 55% cure rate. Uh, of course, it depends on how early you detect it. And there's no substitute for radiation therapy, at least in the near future, although I want to tell you about heart on therapy. Okay? But there isn't a substitute. And the number of patients is increasing because we are living longer, okay? In the so-called developed world. The number of patients are increasing in the developing world because they are finally having access to detectors so they can actually detect more patients so they don't be treated as well. Interestingly enough, there are over 30 countries in Africa and Asia which don't have a single machine to treat cancer, okay? so. There's still big, big challenges even for conventional radiation therapy. But because of the property of x-rays, in about a third of the patients, the cancer comes back to where it was because you're trying to kill the tumor, protect the healthy tissue. So you have to have compromises. And, and you know, and our cells are very smart because when you try to eliminate them, of course, they know how to mutate as well. Okay? And, and one of the things uh, that is used both for chemotherapy and radiation therapy, so you know, I'm sure you've heard about chemotherapy being delivered over time, cocktails, mixtures, and so on, and radiation therapy being delivered in a number of fractions. And, and basically, all of those things, what they're trying to do is take the differential advantage of cancer cells versus normal cells. Our normal cells are not growing rapidly because of this contact inhibition, unless they happen to be pediatric tumors, or is hair or skin. Most of our cells are normally not growing, and the cancer cells are growing very, very quickly. Okay? So when you damage the DNA, our normal cells have time to repair. The cancer cells are growing and dividing more quickly, so they have less time to repair. So this is this idea of differential 
repair system so that with the x-rays you can give fractions to try to give that, take advantage of that. Chemotherapy is more or less the same. But of course you're always running against the issue of the fact that you can always mutate the cells to make them even more aggressive as tumors. Okay? And this is always the challenge as well. Okay? So how can you improve the outcome to get rid of the to improve this 30% imaging, of course. Because if you can really target where the radiation is, you can afford to be much better at differential. Accelerated technology, if you can deposit 100% of the dose in the targeted region without having anything around, then you won't anyone. We haven't got that. And all the other ideas of treatment planning, the sharing, the follow-up, the image fusion, and then, of course, biology, which CERN doesn't have any expertise at all, but it's, it is a multidisciplinary field. You really need all of those things working together. Biology is very interesting, actually, because some cells are radiosensitive, some cells are radioresistant. You have chemicals and things which you can make play with this sensitivity and resistance as well. So if you're trying to protect some cells and trying to kill others, you can use some of that biology as well. And there's actually now research going on uh, our immune system, how to try to use some of this to use our immunity to try to help. Unfortunately, can cancer cells come from our normal cells, so it's very difficult because they, they look very similar in many ways. Okay, so, but there are lots of strategies going on. Okay, so over the last 20 years, and actually even the last 10 years, because as I told you that I was here 10 years ago, lots of changes have happened in technology. So improved delivery of the radiation therapy. In the 90s, you were doing these four constant fields. You know, I was telling you about different fields of how to treat this. Uh, when I came back from the US to Europe, I'm from Britain, in 2000, there wasn't a single IMRT machine in the UK of doing multiple fields. Now there are plenty of them. But now, the current state is this IMRT, which is this multi-field, converging fields with 2D variations and so on. I mean, this is really allowing you to deliver the treatment. This is prostate cancer, by the way. And you see that if you're trying to protect this sensitive tissues, then you, try, you want to deal with the tumor, but trying to minimize the damage to the critical organs. So we've come a long way. The other thing that's changed is, is CT, which is basically 3D x-rays. In 2000, you were acquiring a single transverse slice for rotation. Now, you can do 64 to 500 slices for rotation. So your imaging is becoming really much more accurate. I mean, the data is processed, transmitted, and stored digitally, so you're not relying on x-ray film and so on. All these are really coming from physics-based technologies. And, and the, you know, the modern X-ray therapy, this is one of the variant machines, I think, state of the art, is that now, using gantries, using collimators, using CBCT, cone beam, and so on, you can get quite good conformity to the tumor. And, and, and really, the advances are wonderful. I mean, this is all that's happened in the last basically two decades. However, it doesn't matter how good all of this is, you can't change the physics properties of x-rays, photons, because they are what they are. Okay. So if you want to improve radiation therapy from where it is now, state of the art, particle therapy or hard-on therapy is one of the choices, one of the choices. Okay? And the idea of using hadron therapy or particle therapy, by the way, I keep using this word hadron therapy, particle therapy interchangeably because the physicists don't like particles because electrons are particles, neutrons are particles, everything else is a particle. They want a hadron. But the medical doctor, well, what, what's a hadron? And, and, and just to give you a little bit of interesting uh, tale is when in 2002, and I have a slide about this, when we started, when, when we established a European network in this multidisciplinary field. It was called in light, and it's still called in light. It's a European network for light ion hadron therapy. 
light ions because carbon to physicists are light, and hadrons because that's what we're talking about here. And when we launched this in light, we had the participation of the German uh, uh, project from Darmstadt. It was called the German Heavy Iron Project. And we wrote an article in the CERN Courier, which is the physics magazine. And I had so many letters saying, heavy iron? When did carbon come heavy? You know, so just to say that when you start talking about this sort of field, one is the reality and the second is the philosophy of how do you work together to try to make sure that you have the objective in your head, which is for the physicist maybe it's the Higgs and the black matter, for me it's the patient, okay? So that's what matters, is really trying to get over this. I mean, did you ever think of why MRI is called MRI and not NMRI? Try getting some of your patients to go to something called nuclear. Okay, it's the same thing. So there's a lot of things that are going around. So Bob Wilson, who was the first director of Fermilab, as far back as 1946, said protons can be used clinically because they deposit the energy at the end of the range called the black peak. So, and he said, you know, we have accelerators because Lawrence had already won the Nobel Prize for accelerated cyclotron. We know the maximum dose can be placed in the tumor, and it provides burial of normal tissues. So as far back as 1946. And here is the comparison of the dose depth energy from electrons, photons. So here's protons and here's carbon. So if we've known that since 1946, what's the problem? What's the problem? That's just you know, showing that, of course, if you have a single peak, you have to spread it out, and you have to locate it, and so on. It doesn't matter. So proposed by Wilson in 1946, and the very first patient treated in Berkeley. <coughs> and I guess it's not surprising that Berkeley treated the first patient, because one of the Lawrence brothers was the inventor of the cyclotron, and the other Lawrence brother was a medical doctor. So you really needed the collaboration of a multidisciplinary field able to do that. And by the way, only a mother would volunteer. The very first patient was their mother, as it happens. Because she trusted her sons enough to know that this method maybe is okay. But <laughs> joking apart though, but really. So the very first patient, and yet the first clinical dedicated facility was came into being in 92 in Southern California, Loma Linda. And everything from here to here was done in high energy physics laboratories because they were the only ones who had powerful enough machines, sophisticated enough technology and know-how to be able to do that. I remember doing stuff with my radiobiology on a Sunday evening because that's the only time the physicists would give me beam time to do my biology, okay? But, but joking apart though, it's, so the reason, why do you think it took so long? I mean, if it makes sense. money. Because you see, when, when you're really, health has a lot to do with also some of the practical things. And I mean, and a proton is 2,000 times bigger than an electron. So you need much more powerful machines, much more sophisticated technology, and the will of somebody willing to do that. Okay? And that challenge still remains. That's not going to go away. And so this is why, when you have to start thinking about doing that, I mean, by the way, I just told you that cancer costs 300 billion. So if you can think of a way of, which is good for the patient, good for the economy and the health, and good for the companies, that's the way perhaps to move forward. And if cancer is so expensive, then if you can come up with a way of treating the cancer in such a way that patients have better outcomes, and they have better quality of life, better output, that would help as well, right? So it's an emotive subject, but I mean, the, the thing is, this is this is a big issue. I also want to tell you that, you know, I'm coming from CERN, I want to tell you CERN didn't do anything about this until 96. So most of the stuff that's happened, happened in other high energy physics laboratories, because CERN is dedicated, our mandate is to do particle physics, our budgets are for that, 
and therefore we are very happy as an internationally funded laboratory that our technologies and know-how should be used for society at large, but that's not our mandate. Okay? However, whenever things happen, there are always individuals who are passionate, who are driven, who have visions. We have one sitting at the front, maybe you have one of these facilities in plain. And that was Ugu Amaldi. He's the son of the, one of the founders of CERN, of Eduardo Amaldi. And he, at that time, was a spokesperson for one of the LET experiments. And he decided, he really was interested in this. And by the way, there's personal motivations there as well, because his, one of his first jobs was in Rome, in the Sanita, which is a health institute. Okay? And he was very interested. He always says he goes, went back to his first love. So somehow he, together with Meinhard Regler, who was an Austrian delegate, managed to convince the then CERN management, saying, look, CERN has all this expertise in accelerators. Could they carry out a study to say what would be the perfect medical machine? It was called the PIM study, the Proton Ion Medical Machine Study. And, and their boundary conditions were size doesn't matter, complexity doesn't matter, it's a green fuel solution, the cost doesn't matter. What would be the perfect machine? This is the way the physicists think. And that's why we can think on the horizon and make quantum leaps. And, and that PIM study finished in 2000. As it happens, I joined CERN in 2000. My first, one of my first tasks was, Ugo's got this study now, He'd like to have a facility in Italy. Could you try to help him to see how to do that? Hmm. And, and don't forget, I had just come from Berkeley, where all this stuff started, and the Bevelac was closed in, in the beginning of the 90s, because the DOE thought that this was not something that made sense to do. Okay? So coming to Europe to try to deal with that challenge. And, and one of the things that became very obvious to me very quickly was that CERN and the physics community excelled at bringing people together, working together, collaborating, leveraging for funding, and going for a long-term vision. So I thought, okay, maybe we can have this multidisciplinary network, and that's what Enlight was about. And I had a lot of help from people like Hugo Maldi and the then director who happened to be German, advisors, so on. I mean, I, I just thought it was a good idea. I didn't know how to make it happen, but I had a lot of help, and the timing was just perfect. Now, so coming back to trying to follow the links with CERN, is that so this was happening in 96 to 2000, the PIM study. In parallel, Gerhard Kraft, who really is the godfather of radiobiology and particle therapy, also in Europe. I knew him already because he used to come to Berkeley to come and do his radiation radiobiology studies. Okay? And he was able to be another person who was very convincing in Germany and GSI to use GSI facilities to start treating patients to see, to show the, uh, the, shall we say, the superiority of trying to use carbon ions. So that was the pilot project first pilot project for carbon ion in Europe, GSI together with Heidelberg, and they treated 450 patients with carbon. And this is their setup. Okay? And by the way, I'm going to come back to this pet online later on as well. Um, but just to say, one of the things that was interesting is that besides treating patients, they actually <coughs> came up with an in beam pet doing real time monitoring. And it's one of the first examples in history where you can see what you simulated and what you measured. Okay? Because after all, we are looking to, if you want to know exactly where the tumor is, where you treated it, did you treat it, this is always going to be the challenge. Okay? And it's still a challenge today. But they actually built this machine with uh, Wolfgang Enghardt and Rosendorf, and they actually have it here. And, and they were able to convince the German government and Siemens, because they actually, this is one of the first studies they did, they looked at the tumor control road called chordomas. Not, it's just a type of tumor which is difficult to treat, and they were able to show the difference 
of dose and local control in 2000, this paper is published in 2007. So this is conventional protons, carbon ions, okay? By the way, if everything was so beautiful, it would be great, but this is one of the first ones that did, and you can see the difference between that. And this was enough for them to be able to convince the German government, together with Siemens, to build the very first carbon therapy facility in Europe, which is in Heidelberg, okay? And this is it. And this, this is what was supposed to be called GIP, G-H-I-P, so it became Heidelberg Iron Therapy and not the German Heavy Iron Project because of all those contrasts saying, why do you call it heavy iron, okay? And, and actually, they are treating patients, I mean, uh, and they are actually having quite a success rate. But this technology, I mean, they are the only ones that have a carbon gantry in Europe, and 600 tons is huge. And it's clear that gantries are important to be able to position the beam very carefully, but not everybody can afford 600 tons, not just the material and the cost, but also just even the electricity and the power. So one of the challenges now is how to make these gantries cheaper. And the Japanese have just got one with superconducting magnets, which is about half the size. We would like it smaller, of course. Okay? And here is the Kim study I was telling you about, which finished in 2000. And and that was what led to the Enlight Network. And we actually launched this network in February 2002. Okay. And this is what the landscape looked like in 2002 for particle therapy in Europe then. So that's what it looked like then. And the idea of the Enlight Network is to bring the community together to try to help the realization of particle therapy centers in countries that wanted it. So the PIMS has led to, with a lot of help from Terra, which is the foundation that Ugo Malu established, to the center in Pavia. First patient was treated in 2011, after Heidelberg. Heidelberg was the very first center, but Heidelberg had a lot of help from Siemens, and they helped, and this was really with, now is, is a foundation with help of Terra, with some help from CERN, and INFN, which is a fund, physics funding agency in Italy. So they actually sort of built it together um, and let's treat it. And Medostro, the foundation was 2011, and they treated their very first patient in December 2016. So we've got two uh, facilities uh, from PIMS, and we have two facilities which have come from GSI. One was Heidelberg, and the other one is in Marburg. Okay, but the one thing that happened, and this is, we again talk about commercial centers, commercial aspects. Siemens was the one that was really pushing for carbon therapy in Germany, and they had all the patents and, and so on. But they had a business plan which. <coughs> shall we say unrealistic in their business plan they thought that okay Heidelberg is the first facility so it's an R&D facility to take time but as soon as Marburg came into being it would be able to treat around 1500 patients a year for them to start making money I think it seemed, soon became obvious that this is not going to happen so easily there isn't a single center in the world which is treating 1500 patients at the moment I mean, it's taken a long time for x-ray therapy to be where it is now. So there's a lot of work to be done, and then they pulled out, and now we will see who the new, there's a, there's a Japanese company, and there may be Dan Physique or something like this. But just to say that, again, it's not just the success of the patients, it's also the, the financial aspects. So anyway, so this is now, and this is Medosman, and this is where we are now, in 2016. Okay, so you saw how many centers there were. So there's a huge momentum now in particle therapy. And I show you this. So this is now worldwide. So in 2016, there are 53 facilities in various stages. 
uh, basically operational, almost operational in Europe. There are 25, I think, or 33, depending on which stage you like to call it. And then by 2020, there will be 100 facilities. So actually now there is a huge momentum and the facilities are happening. And I mean, I, I'm coming from the UK and I can tell you that it took our National Health Service forever and ever to decide, because they've been, we've been looking at it for ages, to have two facilities funded by the National Health Service, one in Manchester, one in London. I hope the one in Manchester will start treating patients next year. And London is going to take longer because it's right in the middle of the city and you suddenly realize trying to build a center in the middle of London where there is the, the underground and all the other stuff, the radiation shielding, all the complexities create challenges. However, I was reading only last week that in the UK, the National Health Service will start next year that there are five private centers, single room facilities, and one of them may well be operational this year. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Some is commercial, some is funded by the governments, and, and the main thing is I've just told you that still there's a lot of work to be done. So if it's a commercial center, they're not going to start optimizing this treatment so it's optimally delivered for the patients and it's maximally delivered. They have a business plan. So we'll see what happens. So imaging, as I said, is really the key. And I just a couple of slides from CERN. CERN has been, obviously, I mean, we detect. So this is part of our, uh, shall we say, expertise. But the medical imaging started with George Sharpak in 1968. And these are some of his first images. This is the brain, and these are the kidneys using his uh, multi-wire um, proportional chambers, okay? And by the way, if you read, and he passed away a few years ago, if you read uh, his interview, one of the things he said, one of the most difficult things was to try to make medical imaging and working with companies, because he said it's really challenging. He was really passionate about it, but it's not easy at all. And the next one was David Townsend in 1977, and he started some of the work on PET at CERN. And once again, uh, CERN was saying, well, you know, we are not really a medical physics laboratory. If you want to do this, you should do it outside. So he went to the US. And actually now he's in Singapore with his own institute. Okay, and we know that now PET is one of the uh, underscoring imaging for particularly cancer detection, but others. And crystal clear collaboration, which is producing crystals for our high energy physics detectors, but is also being involved in trying to make PET machines also for clinically as well. So this is a clear PEM, it's a positron emission mammography in order to help screen for breast cancer in women, which is very difficult sometimes with either breast, dense breast tissues or young women. So this helps with the detection process with much higher sensitivity and earlier. And then one of the other things they're working on is trying to have a multimodality endoscopic probe for prostate and pancreatic cancer. And basically what you do is you have your probe inside and you have your detector outside to try to improve detection in this situation. And by the way, and once again, that's interesting, oh, sorry, let's go back, is that when they first made their probe, because it's they made actually a square probe because it was easier for electronics and so on. But you know, endoscopic is not so obvious. So, and then there was the collaboration with their medical doctors in Marseille and Nice, and they said, well, could we please try to make a slightly more comfortable probe, should we say. So the idea of the fact that you may have the technologies, but this inside collaboration is very important. So that's another thing that's happening with CERN. And this idea of PET-CT, Actually, this was the brainchild of David Townsend. And for a physicist, this would be normal because, of course, multimodality imaging is what we do in physics. In order to be able to detect the Higgs, you have to detect everything and then try to eliminate and see what's left, right? So this is really coming from him. And really, I mean, this is now, as I said, the state of the art CT is really quite something, but it comes at a price, which is the dose, okay? So I think that. Anatomical imaging is now really good, okay? 
but we need fundamental change in the information provided by x-rays, probably going towards now molecular imaging. Okay? So Medigix is a pixel detector of medical applications, and, and they are actually looking at single dual and spectral CT. And, and this I was really fascinated because I just had the presentation given by uh, their collaborator from New Zealand, and he actually went from grayscale to material imaging, and, and then starting getting color CTs. So you actually can really now start doing molecular imaging with this. And this is the way to the future, okay? So the new advances, in order to say the tumor and only the tumor, there are a number of things happening. The challenge of PET MRI, we know that it's solvable because CMS is the largest PET MRI machine. And one of the latest development is an MRI-guided accelerator for Linux. And this is the Utrecht group. And it's really seeing what you treat at the moment of the treatment. Really bringing certainty in the actual treatment is where we need to be. And now this is beyond a prototype because actually there are a number of hospitals who have this now. And then we will see where we get to. Because this is going to take time as well. So this is the preclinical prototype. So can we do something similar for proton and particle therapy? Because uh, X-ray therapy is now being driven, delivered optimally. So, it's good that the protons stop. The bad thing is we don't know where they stop exactly. So how do you deal with trying to find out the particle range? So real-time information accuracy of where it is. Okay? And so, could the future be MRI-guided proton therapy? People are starting to work on this. Uh, again, with Utrecht, I guess it's not surprising because they have some of the know-how. But the other one is, remember I showed you that the Germans had this in-beam PET that they could actually look at positrons from the carbon treatment itself. <coughs> they found out that the accuracy was not so good, so could we try to improve it? So there was a project which was funded by the European Commission and if it was involved in this called Envision, and that was prompt gamma imaging. So it's measured the secondary prompt gamma from the actual reaction of protons with the tissue. You measure it immediately, so prompt, okay? And this has resulted in a prototype developed together with IBA, as part of the Envision project and Entervision, which uh, Gabriella has been involved in. And, and it's been tested in Dresden together with Encore, and the goal is to evaluate under cl clinical conditions for rejection of range concern. So, just to conclude really, so we have state-of-the-art X-ray therapy now. It's really delivered up optimally. Further advances, we have we're going to have to start looking at particle therapy. So what needs to be done? Cost is a big issue. Cost must be affordable, but I don't mean just the machine. It should be the price per patient compared to the top range. What is the cost of conventional radiation therapy? The co conventional radiation therapy is no longer two beams like we were 20 years ago. You know, you're doing state of the art uh, CT, PET CT, follow up, many things. So it has to be, become comparable. We have a challenge of how to see, we know the hadron stop, where and how to tackle the organ motion. The Bragg peak is very precise, but it's a double-edged sword. You can't afford to miss it. So you need to know exactly where it is. And when the organ moves, it, you have to be able to move with it. Okay? So we need the symmetry tracking, repainting. And you know, the doctors, of course, quite rightly, are using the maximum tolerable dose for treating the tumor. So if we can get better conformity, we can minimize side effects or increase cure rates, or hopefully both. That's what we're looking for. And then, from the clinical point of view, we need to demonstrate <coughs> clinically the benefit of a conventional radiation therapy. Otherwise, we will never get the National Health Services to take over this. And we also need to see which are the most suitable tumor sites and the patients of a lot of subpopulation which can be treated. We're never going to be able to treat all the patients. We just don't have enough capacity. And, you know, and the radiobiological effect, which is kind of my baby, if you like, we always thought that protons were 1.1 better than the x-rays, which is one. 
But what we are finding is that when you come to the distal edge of this black peak, actually the RBE could be 1.5, 1.6, 1.7. And if you're trying to make your dose plan to protect the edge where there might be a brain stem or pediatric tumors, whatever, and that's exactly where the high energy is falling, you're in a bit of trouble. So we have quite some work to do there as well. And so we need to revisit this. And, and basically, you know, the technical challenge, the clinical challenges, is all about collaborating with the patient in mind. This is where we need to be, and this is where we were 10 years ago in this precise room. And, and I really think it's important that we go from the clinical problem and the physics problem, the physicist saying you've solved the problem, the clinician saying it doesn't have a problem because it has to work together, otherwise we're not going to get where we need to be. And it has to be the patient in mind. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Manjit, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic presentation of the, of the situation of the present times, starting from the old uh, attempts. I, I have a comment and one question. Uh, on the beginning, you show uh, transparency with uh, an impressive number of aspects uh, about cancer that were related to physics. Mm -hmm. I think these days there is a new aspect to which I think is important and not related to particle physics, which is more in the field of atomic and molecular physics, which is uh, understanding from first principle what is the effect of the therapy of cancer on the tumor cells. Okay? Uh, there are already, I see more and more groups that are devoted to that. that means using the therapy, not empirically, you know, to see what are the effects, but trying to understand what is the damage and what is the reason for the damage to the tumor cells, and particularly destroying the ADN. And, for example, one thing that I learned is that the, the effect is not coming from the primary protons. The protons are like a tool in order to concentrate the energy in the region of the tumor. But are the secondary effects and the secondary <coughs> low energy electrons that are damaging the cells. I think this is a very interesting because it's a way to understand and probably will give a, a clues eh, for the future better treatment of the, of the and now not the question. The question is related to the future. Okay? I think you presented very well that there are two kinds of real-time problems. I think these problems should be identified by the medical doctors, but the solution should come from the physicists. Okay? Yeah. I think. Okay. For common. For common. And real-time monitoring, I think, is the clue of it. And you presented like that. There are two real-time monitors. One, which is related to the effect of the therapies eh, online, right, in real time. And probably this is something that is essentially solved, okay? Incorporating, you see, eh, some time response in a pet device eh, in order to see how is the evolution of the function of the organ, you see, during the therapy, okay? I think this is advanced. But there is another one which is important, particularly for moving organs, which is, uh, okay, what you presented at the end, that means uh, the effect, okay, uh, the, the monitoring of the accelerator itself. And, and in that case, this is my question to you. What do you think that is really the problem? Okay, one doesn't know what will be the answer in the future. But what is the trend these days in order to have a real-time monitoring of the accelerator energy, in order to follow, you see, the, the tumor in the moving organs. Probably magnetic resonance device or whatever, but, uh, but I would like to know your opinion uh, about uh, okay, the so, future of that. So, 
Yes, I think MRI would help, but this is why I think this MRI-guided treatment is a good idea. But I think the other thing that's interesting is um, this um, machine that uh, Ugo Maldi's Adam machine that's coming up, which is sort of cyclotron-based with the LINAC, to be able to use that because of the magnetic field to track I think this could be one of the solutions because I don't think we're going to have that from a synchrotron based no, machine. No, cyclotron you cannot change the That's right. So I think it's going to be a linear. No. So I think that so if so in order to answer your question, I think of course if one can start talking about having an MRI proton LINAC, which they are looking at as one, but then actually uh, cyclotron or whatever. All this, the second thing is to really think uh, radically and look at the machine that's going to deliver the beam rather than the actual detection in real time. Since protons are charged, you should be able to monitor them very well and, and track and get immediate feedback to be able to do that. And I think that this machine, uh, which came from the brainchild of Google, allows to be able to do that, but maybe there will be other ideas. And I think that's the way to go. In the meantime, the reality is, unless we also dealing with reality, if there are going to be almost 100 facilities in two or three years from now, which are the standard proton based, either it's going to be a, a Varian, a Tachi, or an IBA, then we have to start coming up with solutions which are going to be able to be coupled with that because you're not going to radically change the people who already have spent 80 million for a four-room facility. I mean, the single rooms are about 20 million, but nevertheless, it's a lot of money, okay? I mean, if I was thinking really radically, I wouldn't even be treating patient protons, I would be treating with helium, because the machine for treat producing helium is more or less the same as protons, and the helium peak is much more conformal, and it gives slightly more energy. But I also have to be realistic, that's not going to happen. But if I could reinvent and just wave a band, that's what I would call it. Because it would solve lots of problems. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, a question I would like to ask is, uh, like we, after your talk you would say, the, in an ideal world, X-ray gradually phases out and 100% of the patients get treated with in the actual, in current, today, Spain, it's 0%. What are the other countries shooting for? So what, what is the actual fraction of the patient population that you want to Okay, I'm going to, to shoot with your home country, which is the Netherlands, okay? Because we just had our live meeting last year in the Netherlands. Um, which, one of the reasons why we had the live meeting there was, was interesting for me, because, you know, it's a small country. How did they manage to convince the health, the medical doctors, and the politicians to have four facilities? To be able to, I mean, they, you have a population of what, 15, 16 million? So we did some statistics as part of night, saying, of course, we are not going to, I'll come back to the fact that everybody should have x-rays or whatever. We, we, we did some numbers. We realized that you have to be pragmatic. You're not going to be able to treat all the tumors with protons. Anyway, you shouldn't. Because it depends on what time, what, when you are able to diagnose, whether it's metastasized, all of those things. And I've just told you that protons and carbon have this bright peak and it's very precise. If the tumor is spread, why would you want to do that? It wouldn't make any sense anyway, okay? So, uh, and then we did some statistics as to what are the percentage patients which really would benefit from particle therapy. And when we were looking at that, we said that we would need at least minimum one machine for 10 million inhabitants. So uh, about 12% of the cancer patients who are going under x-rays would benefit from protons, ideally. I mean, this is the minimum. And about 3 to 4% of those would benefit from carbon. So this, these are the numbers we're talking about. Um, of course, looking at physics, and we're now looking at physics only, of course, Hard roads should be better than x-rays, just because of the physics property. 
But the fact that the results are still waiting, we're looking for clinical trials, we're looking for long time outcomes and so on, tells you a couple of things. And one is, as I said, in the last 20 years, the technology for delivering x-rays has moved so forward that we're delivering them with ideal tools. And also, x-rays don't stop, so you can actually image much better. You have a high intensity x-ray to see where everything is. So at the moment, the way I see it is, we are treating x-rays with optimal tools, and we're using protons and hadron using very rusty knives. So the tools and the technologies have not come to the same level as protons and carbon ions, and therefore the results are still not exploiting the best properties. And the second thing is, if the whole idea of particle therapy versus x-rays is that you're trying to limit side effects, then it takes a while for the side effects to appear. It's not like you're going to see them next day. So some of the trials, some of the long-term effects will take quite some long time for it to appear. And then we have the complexity. There are some results that are coming out that everybody is quite happy to say pediatric tumor should be treated with protons. You don't even actually have to go through clinical trials. This, this most countries are willing. And yet some of the results that are coming out of Boston and some of the others, and because of this RBE I told you about, because you know this thing of, in order to get best radiobiology, best treatment, best planning, you need the mean time to be able to do the studies to be able to do all of this. And for a long time we thought RBE for proton was 1.1. I mean, it was our gospel <laughs> truth. I mean, I actually we did an article as myth or reality, you know. But we know that 1.1 is not the answer, certainly at the distal edge. And that's particularly in pediatrics, where you're talking about very small margins, you're actually causing damage to exactly the tissues you're trying to protect. So it's, it's long time coming. But what I really was impressed by the Dutch model, coming back to us, the fact that they said, we are going to use modeling to try to see which select patients can benefit. Because actually it is one of the few countries that have accepted the fact that they will use normal tissues versus cancer tissue modality to try to select patients or populations. And the second thing is, all four of them stood in front of Utrecht when we did the meeting. By the way, Utrecht is the only one that isn't going to have a proton center, and they were quite happy that it could be central. So one said, we are the center of Europe. The other one, we are center of the Netherlands. We asked whatever, you know, because they had all good reasons. And then Amsterdam, which was slowing down a little bit, wondering what to do, they decided that's where they would treat pediatrics. So they actually came to a really good model. The government said, we'll pay you for this many patients. You can do what you like. And, and you know, there was quite a lot of discussion and competition because, of course, you know, who's going to treat what patients? So I think they realized very, and they're smart, logical people, they realized if they didn't come to some agreement, they won't have any centers at all. So then they came up with a model that the Maastricht will be an R&D facility as a single room. This will treat this many patients. And they divided the 2,400 <coughs> patients which the government and the health service, the private health service and the government is willing to pay, and they came to an agreement. And one of the centers should start treating patients again this year. It's one of the fastest ones I've seen, and the UK being a Brit, I can tell you that <coughs> we've been trying for 10 years, and I don't know when we will really treat it. You said that the number of uh, cancer cases is increasing quite a lot because we are living longer. Yeah. But what about the environment? How important is the environment also for the increase of the number of okay, well, you know, cancer? Epidemiological data is hard to get. You know, So we know that the environment should have an effect. We know that cigarette smoke is definitely, definitively linked to cancer. We know that there are some polyaromatic hydrocarbons in environment and so on. I mean, for a long time, we even said that the EMFs and telephones was causing... But you know, trying to get really hard data is not so easy, but we know that there are some issues. The one clear example which has nothing to do with the price of eggs today, which was very interesting when I was in California, that there was a study done by... Uh, a, there were a population of Japanese women who moved to Hawaii in the California area. In Asia, uh, the breast cancer rate is quite low, but other types of cancer rates are quite high. And yet these women, when they moved to this area, their cancer rate, breast cancer rate, became the same as the local area. So diet, the pill, 
drinking? No idea. So the answer to your question is we know that there are those issues, but epidemiological data is always very hard to be able to say so many definitively. But aging is certainly one of those things. Another urgent question? I think that uh, Marcel is, is attached to the Spanish uh, healthcare. So, I think. so <laughs> I'm not sure he would benefit. He would but benefit. maybe he should try to get the Dutch to come and convince all of you guys. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> okay, just uh, can, can you uh, comment a bit more on the differences between uh, uh, between using a product or uh, or IOPS and what will be the future trend? How you using that? Personal opinion only, not to, okay. Yeah. And now, if you had asked me... Well, both, probably. Yeah, okay. If you had asked me 10 years ago, if I had to have a treatment, did I do protons or x-rays? My answer would be protons are so much better. 10 years later, though, it's not that the protons are any worse, but the x-rays are being delivered so much better. So I think we really need to have the technologies to be able to do justice to protons, okay? This is clear. Actually, even helium would be even better, okay? Now, for me, when we start talking about proton versus carbon, I think carbon or oxygen or something similar because we need a lot, lot more data, it's clear to me that the function that something like a carbon ion can deliver is never going to be possible from X-rays. So when we talk about radio resistance, hypoxia, uh, of precision and so on, I think, so the answer is there. I mean, x-rays are actually being used really amazingly well. Protons should be better. But carbon, once we know more and all the tools, would be fantastic for things which can't be done by x-rays at all. That's my, okay, personal and scientific view, so to speak. Okay, let's, let's thank Manjit again. <coughs>